and this is this is on a continuum. And this is just an example of some dysmorphic ventricles, which just look very abnormal. And you can tell this patient has a shunt. You can see the valve here on this side. Okay, so I'd like to switch now towards MRI. And why don't I take a quick break just to see if there's any any new questions here? Um, we have one or two from the TBI or traumatic brain injury part. Let me see if I could go through some of those quickly. So first question is, in the setting of traumatic brain injury, how do you gauge the risk of hemorrhagic progression and the potential need for decompression? So these are great questions. This, this gets a little more at, at some of the, the management things. So it's good you guys are, are thinking ahead about that. So many times if I have a patient who has significant traumatic brain injury or, or TBI, let's take, for example, the one with that, that frontal contusion that was pretty impressive. Of course, we want to follow their exam. So we use the Glasgow Coma Scale, such that um, we give points for motor movement, eye opening, and, and speech. If the score is over eight, I usually will have the patient admitted to the ICU and just observed with neuro checks every hour. If they decline, we would get a, a rapid, you know, a, a head CT. Really, any neurological change, you always want to get a head CT to see what the cause is. And if the exam is poor and there's a, you know, a, a, a a lesion that you could take out, you know, you could talk about doing that. Um, so the, the question gets at though, how do you gauge the risk of hemorrhagic progression? So usually if it's in the temporal lobe, those seem to progress more. So what do I do for a patient who had a GCS over eight? I would get a CAT scan in a short interval, you know, maybe four to six hours. Some people do longer, some people do shorter, just to see if this um, clot is expanding. If it is, that's someone you need to monitor very closely. If it's not, you know, you would still probably keep them in the ICU for the day. If the Glasgow coma score is less than eight, and you really don't have a good exam to follow, a neurological exam, you could place an ICP monitor, which is similar to an EVD in that you just drill a hole in the right frontal area, but you place a fiber optic, um, basically probe into the brain tissue itself, and that could give you a readout on, on intracranial pressure. And using that, um, you can better manage a patient giving things like hypertonic saline or mannitol, and then figure out if, if medicine is working or if you need to escalate to potentially surgical decompression. So that's, um, you know, temporal lobe contusions I'm a little more concerned about. So for an EDD in a pediatric patient, this question asks, is it preferable to choose Coker's point instead of Keene's? So Coker's point refers to kind of that right frontal area. Keene's point I believe is um, more of a posterior approach. So for EVDs, I, I personally like the right frontal area. I think it's, um, it's positioning wise, it's much easier. Um, the patient's usually laying supine, you stand at the head of the bed and can do your work. Uh, coming in from the posterior area, it's something I think most residents are less um, used to doing. You'll see that though in pediatrics, for whatever reason, I think it's because when you do shunts, so just my, my personal theory, for a child, you can really turn their head to one side and if you do a shunt incision in the parietal occipital area, you can make it down to the belly in one pass. If you do a frontal shunt, you have to make a separate relaxing incision behind the ear and then pass down to the belly. So I wonder if for historic reasons in kids, it's just easier to do a right um, occipital, parietal occipital shunt and make it in one pass. Uh, but that, that's you know, my understanding of it. And then we have another question here, whether tests can be done to diagnose shunt failure if ventricles appear to be non-dilated on CT? So yeah, no, I love these questions. This is really showing that you're thinking ahead to um, how to manage these patients. So there's no great um, single test for a shunt failure. I wish you could do a blood test and say, shunt working or shunt not. A lot of it is, is kind of your gestalt um, take on things. You know, first and foremost, you know, for a child, the patient's mother or father usually could tell you, look, you know, my son clearly has headaches, vomiting, and funny eye movements when he gets sick. And this is exactly the same as it was when he got the shunt put in. That, that's pretty convincing. Um, but there's a few other adjuncts you can use. One is you could ask your ophthalmology colleagues to look in the eyes and look for papilledema. These are changes that occur in the retina that you could visualize by looking um, you know, into the eyes. And that usually shows signs of longstanding pressure problems. Second thing you can do is a lumbar puncture. This, um, you get an opening pressure when you put your needle in. If the ventricles communicate with the lumbar space and it's not obstructive hydrocephalus, you can see a very elevated um, pressure on lumbar puncture. 
if similarly, if the patient already has a shunt in place, uh, many times what I do is I take a butterfly needle and I will tap the reservoir of the shunt. So you saw another picture of the little bubble that a shunt has. I basically will, will place the uh, butterfly needle in and it has a tube of fluid, I hold that tube up. If there is CSF shooting out of the top of that tube, you know, that suggests to me that there is a, um, an ICP problem and the pressure is very high. And I would take that, that patient for uh, exploration. If no fluid is shooting out, what I'll do is attach a syringe to the, the butterfly needle tubing and gently pull back. If I can gently pull back and CSF comes up, that tells me that the catheter in the brain from running from the, the inside the ventricle to the valve must be open because I'm able to pull fluid back easily. If I'm not able to draw fluid back, that suggests to me that the shunt you know, perhaps is clogged. Sometimes you get some brain debris or choroid plexus that can block it. And I would take the patient for a shunt revision. The last thing you can do from the shunt tap is look at distal flow. So many, many valves have a proximal occluder where you put your finger on that occluder, get a nice column of CSF in your butterfly needle tubing, then simply um, you know, take the syringe off and you should see that fluid very rapidly run down into the uh, distal tubing. So if that works, that also suggests to you that the shunt is working. So these are just some adjuncts that you can use. Okay, uh, let's do three more questions and then we'll, uh, we'll keep moving. So in the first AV example, could you discuss how you knew the superficial vessel was a vein and not an artery? So that's, that's a good point. Um, so on the CTA, it's hard to, um, to know that. It's hard to differentiate between arteries and veins. On the angiogram, I showed you one static image, but usually these images are um, continuously obtained over, over time, over several seconds. So you can actually watch as the blood makes its way up the internal coronary artery, goes into this vascular malformation, and then drains out. You know, you know from anatomy what the superior sagittal sinus looks like. If you're seeing that much earlier, than the rest of the veins, then that suggests that um, that vessel we're dealing with is a vein and not an artery. But you can't really tell from the, uh, the head CT. So we have besides fractures, uh, masses, infarcts, and hemorrhages, what other features should we be aware of before labeling a CT as normal? So that's a great question. So I'll show you a few other pathologies. Um, a little more on MRI, but I think you'll get the idea for, for CAT scan. Um, you know, I think radiologists are very systematic in the way they look through things, um, but I'll show you a few more pathologies and that'll help with that question. So what are your thoughts about shunt check? Um, you know, to be honest, I haven't used shunt check um, myself clinically. I've, I've read about it. Um, you know, I don't know if I have a, a full understanding, but from what I've learned is it looks at temperature changes along the tubing to give the user an idea of whether or not CSF is flowing through. So, you know, unfortunately, I don't know enough um, to give you any more, more details on that. But I haven't, I haven't used it myself yet. And then the last one is, how long does a shunt typically last and how frequently do they fail? So unfortunately, um, I would say too much. So there are some studies that show that you could have um, shunt failure within one or some show up to two years, about 40%. So I usually tell that to families when we're placing a shunt. But I also tell them that, um, you know, in our experience, sometimes shunts, patients will have for many years, no problems with shunts. Other times, um, you know, they'll fail multiple times. And the risk of failure is usually higher, you know, when more recently placed shunts. Usually, in terms of infection, usually within the first three months, if someone comes back, you have to worry about infection. Really after six months, it's much less likely if the shunt hasn't been accessed. And you think more about um, mechanical causes of failure, such as um, a proximal catheter being clogged, which is very common. Sometimes as kids age, the shunt may pull out of the abdominal space. Other times if a shunt has been in for many years, um, the body will form calcifications around the shunt, such that um, as a child or adult grows, at some point there's just a tipping point where there's too much tension on that calcified shunt and it will, it will break. So that's another example of shunt failure. Okay, so very good questions, guys. All right, so let's um, focus a little bit more now on MRI. So here we have, again, the three different uh, projections, axial, sagittal, and coronal. 
And MRIs, as you know, are, are much more detailed than CAT scans. They avoid radiation, but they usually are a little bit harder, to, not as accessible to get and take a little bit longer. So we'll show how some uh, how these can be very useful. Okay, so MRIs can be obtained under different settings with the magnet, and this yields different sequences. So some of the main sequences for anatomic MRI, T1, T2, and T2 flare. So on the left here is a T1. I like to think of a T1 as the most anatomical um, sequence. So on a T1, the white matter is white, the gray matter is gray, and uh, the ventricles, the fluid, is black. All right, so kind of your normal, what you normally think. T2, everything is flipped. And T2, you know, the fluid is, is bright, the white matter is dark, the gray matter is a little bit lighter. T2, I think, is, is very good for showing pathology. So if you're just starting out and you're doing clinic, you know, on your sub eye with the chairman and he says, hey, show me, you know, this patient's scan, probably better to pull up the T2 first because that may show you more clearly any kind of pathology. A T2 flare is pretty much the same as a T2. It's just that the, um, the signal for the, the fluid spaces are inverted, meaning that here CSF is dark. This is nice for conditions like multiple sclerosis where you may have lesions that are bright on T2, and you just want to really contrast the lesions around the ventricle a little bit better than if the ventricle were bright already. So flares are another good one for picking up pathology. So in addition, uh, T2 and T2 flare is good at picking up water. And here we see edema, which is just kind of swelling and water in the brain that's caused by this, this sizable tumor that you see here. So this is called vasogenic edema, meaning the tumor, the blood vessels are not normal and they're leaking out some fluid and you can pick that swelling up with MRI. You can pick it up um, a little bit more faintly on, on head CT as well. Um, another sequence that you'll use commonly is called uh, diffusion restriction. It's usually labeled as B1000. So diffusion restriction is very good for looking at strokes within the brain, and really any pathology where um, the lesion is very dense. So some high-grade tumors, things like medulloblastoma, these tumor cells are really packed in together, and these will appear bright on diffusion restriction. In addition, infection also appears bright on diffusion restriction. Now, it's, it's important to check the converse of diffusion restriction, which is the ADC. So usually a lesion that's bright on diffusion restriction will be dark on ADC. If it's bright on both, that suggests something called T2 shine through, where you just have a very bright lesion and it's giving you a false, um, a false signal in terms of diffusion. Okay, so um, another important imaging uh, kind of feature for MRI is contrast enhancement. So during the MRI, a patient will be given a, a bolus usually of gadolinium. It's um, a contrast agent that's used to basically highlight lesions that have breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. So you can see here on the left, this is a pre-contrast image. This is post-contrast, and you can see this it looks like an aggressive lesion that's, that's lighting up on the contrast. A kind of useful way to determine whether or not a scan has contrast, for me at least, is two things. One is the large veins will light up. So this in the back here is the sagittal sinus. You can see that's very bright compared to the pre-contrast scan. The second thing is the nasal mucosa. You see that this is lighting up on the post-contrast compared to pre-contrast. So, you know, sometimes studies get mislabeled, but if you look at the veins and the nose, you'll be able to figure out if it's contrast or not. And clearly, if the pathology lights up, that's, um, that's obviously very helpful uh, as well. So uh, this is just a, a follow-up on that patient. You can see that this tumor was resected through a right temporal approach. It turned out that it was a, uh, a high-grade glial tumor, meaning a, a tumor that arises from glial cells within, within the brain, which are cells that support the nerve cells. I put this up because this was kind of my way of showing, um, you know, during your junior year, when you want to convey post-op films to someone, you want to show the pre-contrast scan, the post-contrast scan, and usually a diffusion weighted image. So you show, uh, the reason, you know, post-contrast, many tumors, you want to make sure that you remove all of the contrast enhancing portion if that's possible. Sometimes you'll see contrast here and you're not sure if that's tumor or just some post-op changes. So if you look, for instance, on the pre-contrast, you see parts lighting up here, 
you see the same parts pretty much lighting up in the post contrast. That suggests to me that this is, you know, just more scar tissue, not actual tumor tissue, because it was lighting up on the pre contrast scan. Now, if there was a large nugget of, um, of contrast here, and I did not see it on the pre contrast, that would make me think there's a large piece of nodular residual enhancing disease left. And of course, you want to check diffusion weighted imaging to make sure there's no large strokes that occurred from your resection if you sacrifice a blood vessel, for instance. So just from a more practical standpoint, these are the, the sequences you'd want to look at after surgery. Okay, so let's apply some of these things to a, a real case. So this was a, um, I believe, a man in his, in his mid-50s who came in with some vision changes and headaches. And on imaging was found to have this, um, this lesion. So we see that um, you know, the sinuses are lighting up, the tumor is lighting up. This is a contrasted MRI showing a sagittal coronal axial. And I should also say when you're you know, presenting to attendings or discussing films, it's always helpful to start out by naming what the sequence is, so identifying is this a CAT scan, is this an MRI, is this an angiogram, and then stating um, what sequence it is. So you'd say this here is in the middle is a coronal MRI, contrast enhanced, showing, and then you could describe the lesion. So that, that's just a very natural um, way of uh, talking to other colleagues in the field. You can see this lesion is very oblong shape, and it's about 10 centimeters down from the surface, so quite a long reach you know, when we're discussing the brain. So I, I like this example because I think it shows you some of the, the thought that goes into a lot of the tumor resections um, or, or many surgeries within neurosurgery. Um, you know, highlights the importance of imaging and then some of the adjuncts that we can use to help us. So one adjunct in terms of imaging is functional imaging. So this is a, a functional MRI that shows us, basically the patient's in a scanner and they're asked to do something like squeeze a ball or do some, some movement of their hand. You know, we know that the motor strip um, will get uh, increased blood flow and oxygen and this can be picked up on a functional MRI. So this is a cortical representation of hand movement, which is shown here. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.